Why do they do this? You've already filmed this before. You don't need to. <laughs> no, I just, you never know when it's gonna happen again. Aha. That's totally not how it works. What's up guys, Jace Two Cents here, and today we're gonna, with all the popularity of Ryzen Threadripper, and I think a lot of people are gonna be buying this processor, I kinda wanted to go over a few tips and tricks, things to kinda keep in mind when building with your Threadripper system, because it's quite a bit different than your standard conventional CPU installations and some things to think about. So today, I just kinda wanna go through some of the basics uh, for the first time Threadripper Builder to kinda be comfortable with doing this because, like I've already said, and I'm repeating myself now, it's different. Today's video is brought to you by CableMod and the CableMod Configurator. If you want custom cables for your computer and you want them custom made with your colors and your choices and your configs, you can do that on the CableMod Configurator. They support all major brands of PSUs, both modular and semi-modular, and you can have cable extensions made. But the best part is, previously they offered aluminum cable combs in only black and white but now you can get them in various colors. So if you wanna take your system to the next step and really make it pop, get some custom cables and make them your way with the Cable Mod Configurator. You can start playing around with that by using the link in the description below. So we'll start with the motherboard and the socket because this is one of the, the first major differences with third gen Ryzen and Threadripper. I'm gonna probably say Ryzen more than once, but that's fine. So the socket is brand new. It's the TRX40. And although it might look exactly like an X399 socket, or whatever they called it in the past, it is quite a bit different. They repurposed a lot of the pins and the layout um, in terms of what does what on each pin. So although you might be able to take a first and second gen Ryzen and slip it right in here and lock it down, it is not the same. So that's kind of sad in the sense that if you've adopted first or second gen Ryzen with hopes of being forward compatible, you're not. That kind of sucks. So it means if you want to take advantage of third gen Ryzen, you need a new motherboard to go along with it. So don't be fooled by the fact that it looks the same. It's quite a bit different. So one of the things that's different with Threadripper, um, going all the way back to when it first launched, come on, get this up, is the fact that the pins are basically LGA. And what that means is that the pins are on the motherboard, not on the processor like you might be used to with standard um, AMD processor. So this is much more Intel-esque, if you will. So what that means is you obviously need to have an awful lot of care when dealing with the socket. Something I'm not really known for, um, care. So what's included with the CPU itself is also this torque wrench. Now this is, now most people might look at this and just go, oh, that's just a T15 or whatever it is. No, this actually has a spring-loaded torque wrench built into the head right here so that it will pop and let you know when the tension is proper. Because what's different about Threadripper versus other CPU platforms is the fact that it is tension based. And that's just to make sure everything's held down properly against um, the, all the pins. So if you take a regular wrench and over tighten it, then you can not only break the screw head off or break the screw entirely, you could over torque it in various areas, make it kind of tweak and bend and then certain pins won't touch. And that will show up in weird, if you even get it to boot, but you don't have all the pins touching, you might not get all your memory channels to show up, some of your PCI Express may not work, you might just have instability. So that's why getting the torque down and getting the, the mount proper to begin with is the first battle to win with Threadripper. Now when you release this top screw right here, it's actually labeled right on the motherboard which order to close and which order to open. So it's just one, two, three to close or three, two, one to open. In this case, when it's new out of the box, it just has this one screw holding it down. It's spring-loaded, so that'll pop up. You got these blue tabs right here that you can pull up for the actual retention bracket itself. Eh, there we go. So these two blue pins will cause this metal bracket, which is also spring-loaded here, to just sort of latch down onto the motherboard. So you can pull those up. And then what you'll see here is that there is this clear sort of a plastic tray. Now, when putting the CPU inside the retention bracket, um, you're gonna notice that the, there's these rails on the side of it that match the clear piece that we just took out. So this is replacing this that you just removed. You wanna make sure that they are inside the actual rail and that they're not popping out. They have a tendency to kinda of wanna do weird stuff sometimes. I'm trying to make it pop out and this one doesn't actually want to, but it, want, it should slide down smoothly. And then when you get to the bottom, it should click in 
just like that. And then when you push it down, push down on the blue tabs, not on the CPU, on the blue tabs because of the fact that that will, if you push down the CPU, you can make it pop out of its actual orange bracket there. But before you do that, you need to remove the actual socket cover. This is what's protecting the 9,000 pins that exist underneath this. There's not really 9,000, but it, there's a lot of pins. But you'll see two parts on the cover here where it's labeled remove. Squeeze that, pull it straight up. Be careful, don't drop anything here. If you do, you're guaranteed to damage and destroy your socket, which means it won't work. Push this down and push down on the two blue tabs. Now it's clicked in there. And now we're ready to actually torque down the lid. Now this is the part that a lot of people get wrong. A lot of people just go, oh, what's it matter? Just torque it in whatever order you want or don't torque it at all. Well, I guarantee if you don't, it's not gonna boot. So taking your Threadripper torque wrench that comes with your CPU, start at number one. You might have to push it down. There you go, get the thread started. And then you're gonna tighten it until the actual uh, torque wrench pops or don't make it pop out of the screw like I just did, but do it until it, it clicks, just like that. So I've seen videos where people will click it and then just keep going, and trust me, that is bad. You don't wanna do that. So it's spring-loaded to the right tension, and then you move on to number two and repeat for two and three. So that's how to properly get your socket and your CPU mounted down so that you have a better chance of getting this to actually boot the first time. The most common thing you see with Threadripper is people complaining about a no post or it won't boot or memory problems. It's almost always due to the, the tension on mounting it down. So I wanted to do kind of a quick PSA, at least on the installation of a Threadripper CPU, although this is the same for first and second gen, because I feel like now a lot of people are probably going to adopt this given its value over Intel when it comes to things like um, computing and multi-threaded workloads. So the other thing we're gonna go ahead and talk about right now is cooling because that's something else that I feel like we need to discuss because included with all Threadripper CPUs is this Asetek bracket. This Asetek bracket is included with the CPU because when the TR4 and now the TR uh, X40 socket came out, um, none, there weren't really, really any cooler options designed to meet the screw spacing of these posts right here. So a standard AM4 would not work and there was nothing prior to Threadripper, so there were very little cooler options. It doesn't come with a box cooler and it doesn't come with an air cooler. As you can see by them including an Asetek bracket, they're recommending water cooling, which makes sense due to the core density and the heat that these are capable of generating. However, what I'd like to point out is why I don't recommend using this. Threadripper's layout is kind of unique. It's got an IO controller in the center, and then it's got chiplets, four of them, all around the outside. Oh, well, technically these are more so in the middle, but they are a perimeter-based mounting mechanism where Intel is very central. It's right in the middle of the heat IHS or the, internal, uh, the integrated heat spreader. So this metal piece on top, which I'm kind of polishing right now because I got a fingerprint on it, um, it's soldered down to the dies and it's designed to absorb the heat and spread it over a larger area and making it easier and more efficient to dissipate the heat. To get the best cooling, even with an IHS, it makes sense to get direct contact of thermal paste and the cooler directly on top of, in this case, the chiplets and the IO uh, die on there. So even though you may not get corner to corner coverage on a lot of options, it's still important to try and get as much coverage as possible. I don't recommend the Asetek coolers, and let me show you why. So this is an NZXT AIO water cooler with a pre-applied thermal paste with an Asetek uh, style pump. So basically this is a standard AIO that would work with pretty much any processor or any platform on the market with the exception of Threadripper in my opinion. And I just kind of wanted to do this PSA because I, I want people to get the most out of their system. Now I'm not saying that by using this you'd be overheating your system. It's it's very unlikely, but what I'm saying is that to get the most out of Threadripper, and if you even want to have any chances of overclocking it, then you want to get the best coverage possible. So if you look at the pre-applied die versus the size of the socket as it is, you can kind of see we're not going to be getting much of a contact patch on the actual CPU IHS itself. So let me go ahead and install the bracket real quick, line up the screws. It's important to remember that although these screws do slide and move on this bracket, um, they are different widths at the bottom and at the top. So it does matter which way you put it. And I just like a, putting a wheel on a car, I don't torque each side all the way down. I just kind of keep going in a crisscross pattern until the threads bottom out. You can bottom out the threads. It's, it's gonna stop before any damage would happen. So I'm even gonna kind of help things along here by sort of squishing it. 
Because you know, one thing that does happen when you warm up thermal paste is it does tend to spread a little bit more. So I want that to kind of stay in the back of your mind right now that the pattern I'm gonna show you uh, will expand slightly after the thermal paste is burned in. So let me go ahead and take this off now. I would actually recommend getting a big air cooler, something like a Noctua or a big Be Quiet, like a Dark Rock or something like that, because you'll probably get better cooling with an air cooler that touches more of the IHS than a water cooler that only touches that much of it. There is coverage, it is touching the IO and it's touching pretty much most of the chiplets, but when you have an IHS and it's spreading all of the heat across that IHS, anywhere you're not making contact with the thermal paste and the cooler is heat that's just sitting there doing nothing. And the whole idea of your cooler is to take that heat and move it away. So if you can take uh, total coverage of the die like we did on Phil's new editing rig by getting the a water block that was the actual size of the entire die, which is what we have, we were seeing amazing temperatures. Overclocked, reaching 60C, what, 60C when you rendered the last video? 62 tops while overclocked and rendering our content. And you're not gonna get it with coverage like that. So. In my opinion, although they give you a solution that would get you up and running, this is not gonna get you optimum results. Now, if you have no choice but to use your AIO with the bracket that came with it, if you're like, Jay, I'm not gonna run out and buy custom water cooling stuff and I'm not gonna spend a, you know, more than $100 on an air cooler, which is what it would cost to get a good Noctua like NHD14 or, or a Dark Rock Pro, um, I would recommend at least changing out your thermal paste. Now here's the thing, like I said, you're not gonna get full coverage with this, but the circle that was on here when we showed the pre-applied was only the very center part. But we do wanna at least try and maybe increase uh, the effectiveness of our TIM or our thermal interface material by using some sort of a reputable brand. <laughs> what I'll do is I'm just gonna make, I don't, have much, I don't have a lot in this tube, but I'm just gonna make sort of an X right here, right in the center of where I know those chiplets and stuff are. Because what I want to do right now is I want to see if we can get a better coverage by using a softer, better thermal compound, replacing the, the pre-applied stuff. Anytime I've used AIOs, I've always pre-applied my own stuff or applied my own stuff anyway and taken off the pre-applied. I just feel like it's a better quality thermal paste um, when I use things like even the EK Echotherm or the Gelid Extreme or the Kingpin stuff. You don't want to apply thermal paste on top of thermal paste, especially when they're two different compounds. You definitely want to use isopropyl alcohol and a soft rag and something lint-free to remove it. See, look at that. That's better. That's certainly better. So that would have given us pretty good coverage of our Tim. You can still see we do have what appears to be some sort of a, I don't want to say concave. That could be the cooler, it could be the IHS. I've never actually looked at Threadripper stuff and whether or not it needs to be lapped. But you can see by just applying your own thermal paste, you definitely get a better spread. And I'd be much more comfortable with that than what we showed you just a second ago. So one last note to make about cooling is, look, bigger is better. It, there's just no doubt about it. It, it. You can't argue that. You can argue that there's diminishing return where you can start to lose effectiveness but that's fine. I would much rather lose effectiveness and have headroom rather than having a cooler that's not big enough. So what I've got right here are two NZXT Kraken coolers. One's a 240 millimeter radiator and one's a 280. On the surface, it doesn't sound like a big difference, 240 versus 280. But you can see in terms of surface area, this is you versus quite literally the guy she tells you is just a friend. You want as much cooling as possible with these 280 watt TDP CPUs. So I would recommend at least a 280 if you can fit it, if you have a chassis that'll fit it. A 360 would be ideal, especially if you're using an AIO. Now the last beginner tip I wanna give is one that is easy to make and a lot of people don't think about it and it will definitely hurt your performance and that is your memory layout. Threadripper is a quad channel system. Unlike your mainstream Intel and uh, AMD, like Ryzen and you know i7 stuff, Usually people are just used to having four slots on one side and then you just put in two sticks of RAM, skip one, and then you're in dual channel or occupying all four and you're automatically in dual channel. But I've, seen a, I've gotten a lot of questions over the years asking me, Jay, which channels should I put them in? Which, where do the dims go? Do I put all of them on one side? What's the layout? Well, the first thing I should recommend is definitely double check with your manual. Although I've never seen a motherboard that is quad channel deviate from this particular pattern. If you're using four dims, you need four because you need at least one channel or one dim per channel. So what you're gonna do is you're going to basically start on the outside, put in your dim, you're gonna skip a slot and do another one. 
Now the mistake I've seen people make is they go from here automatically to, okay, skip one, then put one in right here, closest to the CPU, and then skip one, and then you've got an empty slot on the outside. Well, that would be false, because what you also need to remember is that this is a mirror of the opposite side. You start once again on the outside, skip a slot if you're doing four, four dims. So that's what you would end up with. The two outside most slots are occupied, skipped, occupied, skipped. So the ones closest to the CPU are empty. If you are using eight dims, then it doesn't matter, obviously. As long as they're matched and they're the same speed and the same timings, they're all gonna run at their uh, DCOP or whatever it's called for AMD or XMP for Intel uh, profiles giving you the max speed. So that's kind of it for the my beginner's guide to installing your Ryzen Threadripper CPU because um, this can seem very daunting and kind of confusing to a newbie. And I know when Ryzen first came out, I had to deal with a receipt of the CPU more than once because I think what's also improved is the socket manufacturing and I think just things have gotten better there. So it's one of those things where a lot of us had some confusing, like, well, my system's not posting or I'm not getting all my RAM. And the answer almost always was reseat your CPU, which is also why it's really important to, when you have it out of the box like this or out of the case and you're building, do a test boot. If it boots fine now with a cooler on it, then it's going to work when it's in your system. If you're getting funkiness now, trust me, especially if you're doing any sort of custom or rigid loop, you want to make sure it works long before you boot it. We actually did, did that with Phil's, but he cut it out of the montage. So you guys didn't see me do a test boot, but trust me, we did. I wasn't going to take that bitch all apart again. So that's been uh, today's video. Just kind of showing you some beginner guide stuff to Thryzen uh, Thry Red Ripper. <laughs> It's about to be Thanksgiving holiday. I'm ready to get out of here. So with that, I'm just gonna go.